Action Plan, On-Road Facilities. And we will be speaking with Dan Goodman with the Federal Highway Administration, Bill Schulteis, Vice President and Senior Engineer with Tool Design Group, and Peter Lagerway, Seattle Regional Office Director with Tool Design Group. This is the second of three webinars in October exploring how to create a bicycle safety action plan. My name is James Gallagher, and I am the PBIC Communications Manager. I will be facilitating today's webinar. This webinar has been submitted to AICP and may be approved for one and a half CM credits. The Road Safety Academy, the training and education arm of the UNC Highway Safety Research Center, is a registered provider of CM credits. For more information on the Road Safety Academy, please visit rsa.unc.edu. For more information on future webinars, or to view the archives from this webinar series and others, please visit headbikeinfo.org slash webinars. You also can stay abreast of PBIC webinars and other PBIC news by following us on Facebook at facebook.com slash pedbike. In addition to these webinars, PBIC offers four different in-person training courses to provide technical assistance professionals and community members in developing pedestrian safety action plans and in improving conditions for walking. These courses can be found at pedbikeinfo.org slash get training. Now I'd like to welcome and thank Dan, Bill, and Peter for their presentation today. We will take questions at the end. Dan, take it from here. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Dan Goodman. I'm in the Office of uh, Planning, Environment, and Realty at FHWA. Um, the focus of this webinar is on-road bicycle facilities, and, and I just wanted to mention um, a few things happening at the national level that support and encourage safe bicycling. And that's really, the goal of that is really to provide a little bit of context for the information um, to follow. Um, so hopefully you all um, saw or heard about Secretary Fox's announcement at the Pro Walk, Pro Bike, uh, Pro Place conference in Pittsburgh last month. Um, but he announced um, USDOT's Pedestrian and Bicycle Safety Initiative. Um, and one element of that is uh, pedestrian and bicycle assessments. So those are things that are happening um, right now. There's going to be one assessment um, undertaken in every single state. Um, and we're hoping to be done with that by this summer. Um, so that's something that I think has a direct relationship to uh, bike safety action plans and really the goal of improving um, safety for bicyclists. Um, another thing that, that we're working on, which I think is relevant to this webinar, is, is an increasing focus on the concept of connected pedestrian and bicycle networks. Um, so that's really um, um, supporting and advocating and documenting um, and promoting, really, um, connected physical infrastructure that makes walking and biking um, a viable transportation choice. So that's something that, that we're working on right now really hard. We've also got a lot of data initiatives happening, which, which we're really excited about and I think have a lot of potential. Um, so we're, we're looking at the traffic monitoring guide. As I'm sure you all know, the TMG now has a pedestrian and bicycle data um, chapter, which I would encourage you to check out um, and follow. Um, and we're also working on the, the travel monitoring analysis system um, so that it can handle pedestrian and bicycle data. Um, we also have a road diet guide um, coming out um, in 2015. Um, if you haven't heard, we've got a, a program called Everyday Counts. Um, and it's the new one is the EDC3 initiative. And one of the focus areas is road diets. Um, and that is, is something, as you know, has a real big potential to improve safety and also um, enable the creation of connected bicycle networks. Um, and improving the safety is really something that um, you all will be talking about as part of this webinar. Um, we also have, for the last year, FHWA has been working on a separated bike lane planning and design guide. Um, that is going through the review process right now. Um, what the document is going to do is really highlight planning and design best practices for separated bike lanes, also known as cycle tracks or, or protected bike lanes. Um, we did, the, the document is going to talk a lot about the design process. It's going to emphasize design flexibility. Um, it's really going to present a menu of design recommendations and design options. Um, we did an extensive um, crash analysis as part of the document, um, and that'll be included in the appendix. Um, and I should say that, that HSRC led the effort, um, and Sam Schwartz and Kittleson also helped um, put that together, and we're really proud of the product. Um, there's a lot of case studies. Um, we're going to link together with the concept of networks and really talk about how separated bike lanes are one facility that can be used 
um, to create connected bicycle networks. Um, and that, so, so just to give you a heads up, the document we're hoping will, will come out in early 2015. Um, and we would, we would expect to have um, a public webinar as part of the release of that happening at some point in the spring. Um, so keep your eye out um, for that. Peter, could you forward the slide for me, please? Um, the other thing I wanted to mention sort of as context for, for what you all will be talking about on this webinar um, is we've got a lot of work, pedestrian and bicycle work going on at the national level um, that I think will really move the ball forward on a lot of different topics. The list here, I won't go through every individual project, but these are all projects that are moving right now and that you'll be hearing a lot about over the next um, 12 to 16 months. As you'll see, there's there's a big emphasis on, on moving the ball forward on design. There's a big emphasis on network creation. There's a big emphasis on data. Um, and, and really underpinning all of it is a focus on safety um, and also a focus on equity. Um, you'll see that a lot of the, the individual projects are going to be wrapped up into a more strategic piece that's really going to focus on um, where we are today and where we need to go. Um, on things like data and research and training and design guidelines. So that's a project. The Strategic Agenda project is also one that, that is kicked off and, and is moving right now. Um, I want to encourage you to check out our website. Um, you can go there to get updates on these projects that are on this slide. Um, and also, um, just so you're aware, we've recently updated the funding table on FHWA's website specifically for pedestrian and bicycle projects. Um, and there's a lot of information on policy background, specifically the 2010 memo um, is on our website, on the front page of our website, and that's, that's still our policy. So um, I think what you'll find is that, that USDOT and FHWA are really providing proactive leadership on pedestrian and bike issues and really looking to move the ball forward and, and encourage more people to walk and bike and to do it safely. Um, so, so with that, I'm going to pass it back to Peter um, to talk about um, the content of the webinar. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, uh, James, can everything, you can hear me coming through okay? Yep, okay, I can great. see your screen and uh, I can hear you fine. Okay, wonderful. Well, welcome to the second of um, three webinars that we are doing. Uh, the first one was on planning. Uh, the second one is on on-road bicycle facilities. And then the third one will be on trails, off-road bicycle facilities. So again, uh, my name is Pete Lagerway. I'm going to be doing sort of the first half of the webinar. Uh, Bill Schulteis will be doing the second half, and then we'll be both taking questions uh, a little bit down the, down the line here. So uh, in terms of the outcomes of what we're looking at today, uh, really four different outcomes. One is to be able to recognize the relationship between having a complete network and safety. In other words, uh, one of the things that we're finding is that we can reduce crashes by having uh, networks at work and, and it results re uh, directly to safety. Uh, the second um, outcome that for today's webinar is that you'll be able to uh, describe how bike plans can result in increased safety. In other words, how do you frame a plan, what needs to be in a plan so that you get better outcomes when it, when it comes to safety. Uh, the third area is just to recognize that uh, bicyclists are a very diverse group and we'll be looking at some crash data and we'll be looking at how you need to really have a focused plan and focused countermeasures that address unique kinds of crash patterns in your community and focused on different kinds of cyclists. And I'll talk more about that, but it's specifically related not only to facilities but to education programs. And then finally, um, we're going to be, uh, one of the outcomes is to be able to identify countermeasures and practices that directly result in a safer, safer system. So those are the four outcomes we've been looking at. Again, going to the next slide, uh, this just puts you put in context again. This is the second of three webinars in two weeks on the 30th. Again, will be the third webinar on off-road facilities. So the first section, I'm going to be talking a little bit about resources and safety analysis and the different approaches that can be taken. Um, this slide, just to remind us that uh, when we do this, it needs to be grounded in national design uh, resources, 
you see there um, on the left of your screen the Guide for the Development of Bicycle Facilities 2012. You see the METCD, the Manual Uniform Traffic Control Devices, and then you see the NACTO Guide, an Urban uh, Bikeway Design Guide. And, and again, the point here is that when you develop your state, regional, and local plans, it's real important to um, ground it in some of these national design resources. And of course, the good news is, is that we really have uh, good materials available now that we can uh, do that from. Uh, a second point I would just make is that, that um, uh, it's often good to look at what's happened, uh, what's been developed at the state and local level. Uh, these are just two of many, many examples, two very good examples, uh, one with the uh, state of Wisconsin here, and then the Boston Complete Streets Manual. And uh, the point here, again, is that uh, a lot of these go above and beyond what's done at the national level, uh, but they still need to be grounded in the, na in the national guidance. So uh, again, uh, look to some of these when you're looking for models on how to do this. Talk a little bit about um, crash data analysis, and crash data um, can do a number of things. When you do look at it, uh, typically you want to look at least five years, and the reason here is that um, uh, it, when you start looking at a map, uh, bike crashes, so at one level there's quite a few. They're still relatively rare in the sense that if you really want to look at patterns and get a sense of what's going on, you want to look at five years. Uh, reviewing police reports can be another way to get some really good crash data. Uh, in fact, that's where the source is for a lot of crash data. But you can actually review the reports and get more in-depth. Uh, sometimes uh, emergency room or first responder, sometimes that can be the fire department, uh, may have additional crash data on you know, responses at a per particular location. And that can be uh, a very good place to get additional data. Could also yeah, be an emergency room at your local hospital. Some of the things to look at when you're looking at crash data, and it's important to know that bicycle crash data is going to be quite different in terms of how it expresses itself geographically than, say, crash data for motor vehicles. Um, one of the things you do want to look at, of course, is, is hot spots, particular intersections. But quite often, um, you're also going to see it expressed along corridors. So sometimes you can identify a number of corridors in your community where the crashes tend to occur along. And so sometime, rather than doing a spot location, you're going to be looking at a corridor solution in terms of addressing crashes. The other thing that you want to look at is sort of major crash types. I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. But you really want to look at, at the crash typologies. And then that will lead inform you when you start making decisions on both the kinds of countermeasures that you may want to uh, institute, it also will inform you in terms of the kind of uh, uh, education programs you might want to do. Same as, dem same as for demographics. Uh, when you look at your crash data, you may find a high concentration of crashes, say, with children or seniors, and then that may lead you to focus, for example, some of your education out, um, efforts. So in terms of uh, crash, data, uh, crash data analysis, um, the, the uh, crash data is, is, is really important. Uh, it can do a lot of things. It can you can help you discover uh, crash types and behaviors. Uh, you see a heat map here. It can also help you target specific areas. So sometimes uh, I had mentioned a corridor, but you may also have a, a neighborhood where there's a lot of crashes. So for example, you may have a college or a university where there's a lot of crashes that are clustered. And I think you can see from this map, too, there's a looks like a couple corridors here where they're clustered. So it really, again, uh, when you start looking at a map like this and mapping the crash data, uh, it really starts to inform where you want to put your energies, uh, informs the selection of the kind of facility you might. It also informs uh, some of the education outreach programs that you might do. Um, well, crash data can do a lot. It's also important to understand uh, the limitations. It's only part of the story. Uh, sometimes the crashes are so dispersed that you just don't get a real sense of what's going on. Um, it doesn't include near misses. And um, you, know, you may have a location that has no crashes, but it's just perceived as so dangerous by the public that nobody, nobody bikes there. And then, of course, you have no crashes. So 
simply noting there are few or no crashes at an uh, intersection or along a corridor may not mean that you shouldn't be doing something there. It may not mean that it's, it's really safe. So crash data is a piece of what you do, but it's not the whole story. And then, of course, crash data may be incomplete or inaccurate as well. So some of the tools, things that you can, you can do in terms of uh, sort of getting a, a handle on this as you move forward with a, a bicycle uh, safety action plan. Uh, one of the tools that's available through FHWA, uh, you can see it on the right here, is the Bicycle Road Safety Audit Guidelines uh, prompt list. Uh, I'm not going to read through the whole list here, but this is taken directly um, from that guidance, and it gives you a step-by-step -step process for going out and doing a, rate, a road safety audit. Uh, there's a lot of different audits out there. This is one that's available. It's very, very good, and you can use it um, on neighborhood streets. You could use it on a bike facility. You could use it on an off-road trail, um, but it gives you a step-by-step -step, uh, process for going through, identifying the location, doing the field work, uh, collecting the data, doing some analysis, and then coming up with uh, improvements that uh, could address some of the some of the uh, safety issues that say you might discover when you're doing your audit. Um, there's also, and this is again from that, that, that same manual, uh, there's a lot of specific guidance in there that helps you ask the right questions. So, um, so for example, here, uh, this is just one of a number of them. You look at number seven here and ask questions like, are bicycle accommodations continuous? Uh, do they end abruptly at a bridge or tunnel, et cetera? So, um, a lot of times I think this is a really good place to go just to begin to ask the right questions when you go out and do your field work. So some other uh, countermeasure uh, resources, of course there's the NCHRP 500. It's the guide for reducing uh, collisions involving bicyclists. I would definitely uh, look at that and use that. Uh, and of course here you see the bike safe that Dan talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, the revised bike safe was just re um, released, I think about a week, week and a half ago, something like that now, and uh, a very, very good tool because it gives you, uh, it looks at both the background, the statistics, the analysis, but then also comes up with uh, countermeasures and really gives you a, a selection tool for how do you decide what countermeasures you want to go with. So I would, I would highly recommend it. Also, again, in the back of uh, bike safe, are some case studies, examples of what other communities have done. So um, crash countermeasures, uh, call it CMF. Um, one of the things that I would just, just caution about, um, the good news, for example, on the pedestrian side is that we have a lot of research and we have a lot of crash modification numbers that we can apply to specific countermeasures. Um, on the bicycle side, uh, they're, they're more limited, so you're not going to see as many CMF um, numbers out there that help guide your thinking. Uh, I think we have uh, you know, a good intuitive on a lot of it. Uh, we certainly are focusing on the connectivity and creating systems, uh, but at the same time, I think we need to, to just acknowledge that uh, there's areas here where we could use some more research. Uh, the Bike Safe again has a lit review of the different countermeasure research, and uh, and there is there's some available. And again, I would direct you to Bike Safe. So um, just a little bit about crashes, and I'm not going to show you a lot of numbers, but um, just for example, from 2012, you can see the number of people killed and injured. About two percent of all traffic, or uh, excuse me, two percent of all deaths and fatalities. But again, um, only 1% of all traffic. So uh, you know, looking at those kinds of numbers, uh, looking at your funding, starts to really uh, create a framework in which uh, to move forward in terms of addressing some of the crashes. I just throw this slide in. Uh, we used the same uh, slide during the last presentation. Uh, but it's just to make the point again that it's really important to know your audience. So when you're building facilities, when you're doing outreach programs and you're doing education, they're going to be different for different kinds of cyclists. And so uh, the kinds of things that you might target, say, kids with are going to be quite different than maybe what you target seniors with in terms of addressing safety issues. They're going to have different kind of crashes, 
they're going to be receptive to different kind of messaging. So the, the point here again is, is it is very useful to get a really good sense of what's happening in your local community. So this is just an example of um, you know, something you might want to consider and, and to sort of use the FHWA numbers. Uh, you can see the, the top the column there, uh, uh, data that was collected in the early 90s, and then compare your community to it. And I really like this first line here where it talks about uh, motorist failure to yield at an intersection. So you see it's about 14.4% under the FHWA numbers. Uh, North Carolina urban, almost identical, but then you go to North Carolina rural and it drops way down. And that's to be expected because in a rural area you're uh, not going to have very many intersections. So, um, so it really starts to say that, that maybe there's some different strategies for urban versus rural areas in this particular example. So again, <coughs> doing some of these comparisons, kind of seeing where you are in relationship to to other data can be a very, very good way of getting a sense of, of how you should proceed. Um, I think sometimes also it's it's good to sort of look at um, pre-crash maneuvers, what's happening in, with motorists, say, versus uh, a bicyclist. And, and sometimes you'll see a lot of commonality, but you're also going to see some differences. So if you look at this particular chart, you'll notice that going straight and if you look at the left, that's motorist. You look at the chart on the right, that's bicyclist. You know, they're, they're very comparable. Um, on the other hand, when you start looking at the second column, making a right turn with the uh, motorist is, is pretty high. And it's sort of comparable on the, on the bike side. But um, here, here it's more cataloged as riding in a crosswalk. Exactly if they're turning or not isn't clear. But you, you can see the numbers there. I don't need to, to read them all to you. But I think um, you know you can go down the line and, and go to the last one here, uh, entering, exiting, exiting an alley or driveway. Again, they both show up as, as crash types. Both of them show up as sort of the fourth one here. Uh, so doing some of those kinds of comparisons and looking for similarities where there might be slight differences is also another really good way to start looking at crash data. And then quite often it's just important to diagram it. And, and here um, on the left, you can see broadside from the right. Uh, the one on the right is is the left hook, which we're all familiar with. And you know, sometimes simple drawings that just show a different kind of crash typology that's occurring in your community can be a really good way to have a conversation about it, uh, talk to decision makers, talk to the community. So I'm going to um, talk a little bit about um, crash reduction countermeasures and um, really talk about the relationship, the relationship between uh, the network and safety. So in terms of, of network solutions, and, um, and again, you, mentioned, you heard Dan mentioned uh, the importance of, of connectivity and networks, and we're really going to build on that theme here. Um, you know, just a few basics here, and I think probably all of us have heard this before, the idea that routes need to be direct. Uh, cyclists, uh, like everyone else, want to get to from A to B as quick as possible. Uh, sometimes you have a circuitous route for a good reason, but it shouldn't be built in and just assume people will follow it. Uh, it needs to be seamless. Um, and in one, one of the things that I always like to focus on is uh, where there's transitions, especially between facility types and where you get sort of a gap in sort of the, the system sometimes if you say go from a, say a protected bike lane and all of a sudden there's nothing and you're in a busy traffic situation well you've invited somebody to a certain a certain kind of user and all of a sudden they're going to be in a in an area where they're not real comfortable so that that seamless system that it, it just flows from one to the other uh, different facility types usually is very important Fine-grained, what we mean by that is that the little details count. So things like uh, getting the drain grate right, uh, making sure that the seam that's in the concrete isn't in the middle of the bike lane, or if it is, it's filled so you don't get caught in it. So it's those real fine-grained details that become particularly important for bicyclists. Third one I think is really, uh, again, very important as well, uh, the idea of comfort. It has to be comfortable. So, you know, there's 
it may be statistically safe, but if people aren't using it, they don't feel comfortable in it, uh, they're, they're not going to use the facility. And I always like to say people vote with their feet. And when they're voting with their feet, um, they're going to go where there, there's a certain level of comfort. And, we, and again, we know that for the majority of cyclists, um, you know, feeling comfortable, feeling safe, um, having some separation from motor vehicle traffic can be very, very important. And then finally, again, um, the idea of connectivity. And, and connect it, being connected is not just having a connected system, but it's connected to destinations. It needs to be connected to where you want to go. Uh, it may be very important in your community, for example, to connect to transit. It may be very important to connect to a local uh, hospital or a local university or a downtown area. Uh, each community be different, but that connectivity really also includes a conversation about destinations. So this is just an example. Um, this is Washington, D.C., and you can see here that um, Back in 2000, um, there were not a lot of facilities, and I'm not going to go through the, the whole code here, but you can see that there was uh, a lot less cycling. And then you flip it up to 2005 to 2009, a lot of new facilities were, were put in. And you can notice right away that um, there's a, uh, almost a direct relation between the facilities going in and more people bicycling. I might mention one other thing here is that what we find, we're find we finding, uh, and we're still learning in this area, but what we're finding in a lot of communities now is that as the number of bicyclists increase, the crash rates start going down. And, and uh, what, what happens is, is that if there's a lot of bicyclists, then it becomes something that motorists are looking for. One of the things that we find when you look at crash reports and you ask the motorists what was happening, they'll almost always tell you, I didn't see the bicyclist, uh, the most frequent answer that you'll get from a motorist involved in a crash of the bicyclist. And if there are almost always bicyclists there, it becomes part of your visual screening. You expect to see cyclists. And so over time, we're finding is that the rates start going down. So this is the uh, final slide that I, I have, and then I'm going to turn it over to Bill here. Um, and this just shows the relationship between speed and volume. And uh, again, no surprise here is that as speed and volume ADT go up, uh, people's interest and desire for separation of bicycle facilities also go up. So you can see in the left hand, lower left-hand corner where speed and volume are low, people are more comfortable with shared lane situations, bike boulevards. Uh, again, as speed and volume go up, there's going to be uh, more interest in bike lanes, protected bike lanes, shared use paths, uh, cycle tracks, those kinds of things. So with that, I'm going to uh, give this over to Bill. OK. Get started here. I want to confirm that the slides are changing. So, do you have a photo up? Shared lane safety challenges. We do. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Okay. Well, thanks, Pete and Dan. Um, that was a great intro to uh, the remainder of this session, where I'm going to actually get into the details of how do we handle some typical safety challenges and deal and what are typical crash countermeasures that we can employ on our roadway network as we're building up a, a system of bicycle um, lanes and trails and trying to create a connected network, as, as Pete was alluding to. Um, what are the individual components that we want to be working on, and how do they address particular behavior or safety challenges? Uh, so first and foremost, uh, Safety challenges in shared lanes, things we see a lot, we, you know, shared lanes are everywhere. Any travel lane without a, a separate bike facility is a shared lane. And there's certain types of behaviors that we see a lot. Um, not sure if you'd notice in this screen or not, but uh, there's, a, there's a bicyclist in it. So I'll give you a second to kind of scan and look for them. Uh, but generally, there's a, a discomfort a lot of cyclists have in a shared lane situation due to 
you know, it could be the intense traffic volume or higher speeds, as Pete was alluding to, and they, that can be much more, uh, the higher speeds are really a factor in urban areas during off-peak areas, non-peak times when there's not much congestion, and then during congestion periods, as you can see in this photo, um, what happens is that uh, cyclists are not wanting to wait in a, a queue of cars, and they're looking to kind of filter around the sides of cars. And that can, both of those can lead to comfort and safety challenges. So at this particular location, you can see there is a gentleman riding the wrong way uh, in this street. And there's no bike facility out there, no lanes or signs. Um, and something that we've observed a lot is that sometimes people translate their pedestrian training to, to walk facing traffic on roads without facilities, pedestrian facilities. Uh, we, we definitely see in our, in our work that sometimes people translate that into bicycling and they think that because they can see cars approaching them, uh, they're very nervous about cars approaching from behind, that they think it's safer to ride uh, in the opposite direction as traffic. Uh, when the reality is it's actually one of the, one of the highest causes of crashes for bicyclists. Um, and, and that research project, uh, NCHRP report, they documented from multiple crash studies, but about 32% of all crashes involving a bicyclist, uh, the major contributing factor was wrong way bicycle riding. So this is a, the largest contributing cause of, of bicycle crashes um, out there. Um, and then when it came to intersections, that number jumped up even higher to 42% of all inter bike crashes at intersections involved wrong way bicycling. So how can we uh, address this challenge? Uh, the photo shows here is you know, one option in a shared lane situation, maybe you don't have space for a separate facility, separate bike lane, is adding the shared lane marking, uh, adding some supplemental signs. Uh, you can see the bicycles may use full lane sign. That, that sign helps convey to the bicyclist and to the motorist that the bicyclist has the right to operate in the lane and not have to ride to the, to the edge. Um, another supplemental sign that has been shown to be somewhat effective is using the wrong way, ride with traffic signs. Now those are placed on the opposite side of the road, but facing in the direction of uh, where the wrong way rider would actually be visible to the wrong way rider. So those two <coughs> signs and combinations with shared lane markings uh, could be a strategy to, to help you address this issue. Um, we've definitely, in the research that has been done on shared lane markings, they've been found to be effective in reducing sidewalk riding and to improve rider positioning. Another challenge that comes up with wrong way street riding happens on one way streets. So if you're in a network with a lot of one way streets and bicyclists are looking to make shorter distance trips, that point A to B, as Pete was discussing in the network. Um, what you may find is that there may be certain streets that there's a, a strong pattern of wrong way bicycle riding, as you can see in this photo example. So a potential solution there is to make the street actually two-way just for bicyclists. Um, this is a project a, a example in Seattle uh, where there's a one-way street near a, a major trail um, and there was a lot of wrong way r riding occurring here. The street was of sufficient width where uh, bicyclists felt comfortable doing that. The traffic volumes weren't too high. Uh, so what the city of Seattle did is they actually implemented a contraflow bicycle lane. Um, it helped by adding that change, making it two-way for bicyclists, adding just the simple exception that they do not enter and making sure the traffic signals on either end, actually there's a signal facing the contraflow movement for bicyclists, helped legalize this behavior and improve the safety for all users. Uh, by improving expectations uh, to expect bicyclists to be there, uh, and then creating a safe space for the bicyclists to ride. Another thing that we see a lot on streets without bike facilities, and again, this is a particular challenge on higher volume, higher speed streets, is you can see a lot of sidewalk bicycling. Um, in this photo example, you can see a bicyclist coming towards us, uh, approaching the school bus. Uh, but again, this is a, another very common type of crash, is wrong way sidewalk riding on arterial streets, which can, can have very serious safety consequences. Um, the City of Denver has recently completed a crash analysis of the last 10 years worth of crashes within, their, within the city limits. 
and they found that 34% of all crashes involved a bicyclist riding on the sidewalk. Um, and of those, 66% of those 34% of the total crashes, 66% of those were bicyclists riding on the sidewalk against traffic. 53% uh, of those streets were arterial streets where there was no parallel bicycle lane or path on, on the street. Um, so the challenge, again, obviously, is it's an unexpected maneuver when a cyclist is on a sidewalk um, operating contraflow to traffic. It's a, it's a place motorists aren't looking at when they're making their turning movements for a bicyclist. So how do we address that type of uh, situation? So again, these are multiple options. I discussed the shared lane markings earlier, but other options that have a higher rate of success is actually creating a separate space with bicycle lanes or separated bicycle lanes as you can see in this photograph. Um, they both promote and reduce wrong way riding and they both encourage cyclists to stop riding on the sidewalk and come out into the street. Another aspect of sidewalk riding is um, sometimes there's facilities that are designed, uh, but they're not designed to the national standards or even to the local standards, as Pete introduced earlier. Um, and so this example, the bicycle lane or shoulder, is much too narrow to comfortably ride. There's two challenges. It's, it's too narrow, and then there's a gutter seam between the asphalt and the concrete that lines up about where our bicyclists would want to ride, so it makes it unsafe for them to travel in that space. So then you, the result is you end up with cyclists riding on the sidewalk. So if we install infrastructure that's not up to the standards as prescribed, it's, it's highly likely that you won't get the use uh, and behaviors that you intend. Strategies uh, to resolve these, to create space, you know, one obviously is lane diets. And this photo illustrates it very nicely, how you can narrow up the travel lanes and you can see on either side of the center turn lane that the lanes that were uh, ground out. And then you can use that extra width to create enough space to put in standard width or high quality by bi separated bicycle facilities such as these bicycle lanes. Um, the Astro Bicycle Guide is the, the first Astro document that actually speaks to allowing and encouraging the use of 10-foot lanes in urban areas. Um, and it's based on an NCHRP project that uh, studied 10-foot and 11-foot travel lanes in urban and suburban areas and found that they don't have any increase or that they don't contribute to increases in crash rates. Uh, so again, to reiterate, the Astro Bike Guide um, sanctions the use of 10-foot lanes in constrained situations so that you can add in separate bike facilities because of the safety benefits associated with calming traffic and creating that separate space for cyclists. Uh, another benefit, you maybe you have bicycle lanes that already exist, but uh, by narrowing up those lanes, you may be able to actually install buffered bike lanes. Um, a buffered bike lane increases the comfort, and it actually uh, further enhances the, the correct use of the facility. Um, and we talked about in the last webinar and, and briefly today, uh, it, it speaks to providing a facility that's more comfortable for uh, those users that are less comfortable in traffic. Um, sort of that 8 to 80, you know, younger folks and older folks that are very sensitive uh, to being in close proximity to high-speed moving traffic or, or volumes of traffic. Another common uh, crash type, especially in very common in rural areas, is uh, overtaking or struck from behind. Uh, in rural areas, 29% of, of all crashes are actually overtaking crashes. Um, where a motorist comes up behind a cyclist and squeezes them off the road or actually strikes them from behind. 17% um, in rural areas are also crashes that uh, have to do with merging or turning, but combined uh, we're talking about 46% of crashes have a strong relationship to the lack of space in a rural road and the roadway geometry itself. So obviously a solution to that is to put in shoulders. Uh, also, you could put in separated bike lanes or normal bike lanes uh, or shared use paths, but creating that additional space in those areas of rural roads where you're having, the, you know, you have sight line challenges, horizontal or vertical curve challenges that limit sight distance, uh, those would be very good strategies to improve safety for 
for bicyclists and also have the side benefit of increasing safety for pedestrians. In urban suburban areas, these still uh, can be a, cra a crash type that may crop up and be a higher percent crash type in your community. Um, this is another example, again, kind of congested conditions, uh, cyclists looking to make their way through that traffic and, and not be as held up by it. Um, or they're concerned about sharing a lane with traffic and so they tend to ride on the edge of the traffic. Uh, and this can lead to side swipe crashes and or strike from behind crashes. So again, another type of solution, as I talked about, is from adding shared lane markings, bicycle lanes. Um, but increasingly in urban areas, you're seeing uh, attention provided to providing separated bike lanes. Uh, this is an example from the NACTO guide that's actually a curb separated bike lane. Um, and as you can see here, this is an area where there's some on-street parking and they provide a concrete island or a buffer space for a person's car door to be able to open and not open into the bicycle lane. So that's a very good technique uh, to improve comfort and safety. Here's another example uh, where it's a buffer with some vertical flexible delineators placed in them to, to maintain that space and keep the parked cars out of the bicycle lane. Uh, this is a two-way facility example, um, but these can be obviously, these eliminate struck from behind or side swipe crashes, uh, but the key at these locations is to pay very close attention to the design of your intersections uh, with streets and your intersections with driveways and alleys. So when we're looking at countermeasures, uh, if you're going to implement separated bicycle lanes, uh, a couple strategies that you can employ, um, you can restrict parking so that there's good visibility to the conflict area. Um, this, this photo example actually also shows a technique where you can provide a separated crossing phase so that the bicyclists and the pedestrians even have their own protected crossing phase. Um, and another strategy that's frequently deployed is the use of color for the conflict zone to highlight attention. Um, all three of those te techniques are very valuable in improving safety at intersections with separated bicycle lanes. Um, and locations in urban areas where there's a lot of on-street parking, um, dooring can become an issue where you have a relatively narrow parking lane and a, and a narrower bicycle lane that when the motorist gets out of their parked car, they're opening their door straight into the bicycle lane. And if they don't look, they could actually hit a bicyclist. Uh, these can be very, um, these generally produce injuries, sometimes fatalities, uh, because it's so quick. Uh, bicyclists ride into the edge of the door as it's opening, or sometimes they're adjacent to the motorist as the door is opening, and they're pushed into moving tra a moving traffic lane, uh, where they then can be subsequently run over by a, a moving car. So there's some strategies to try to mitigate that. Uh, if you're in a situation where you got a steep hill, a steep grade, and you're considering adding bike lanes in both directions, um, that may be a good decision. Uh, but you may also want to think about that available space. If it's a commercial area where there's a high turnover of parking, and you've got narrow parking lane and narrow bike lane, um, and it's a relatively steep hill where bicycles can be reasonably expected to travel at speeds close to 20 miles an hour, 25 miles an hour faster, um, you may want to consider actually doing a climbing lane, uh, where in the uphill direction you can actually make a wider bike lane uh, so that there's less impact from that opening door. And in the downhill direction, you're really encouraging cyclists to just share and get into that lane of traffic uh, and, and away from the opening park car doors. The climbing lane is also another technique. Uh, if it's not a dooring countermeasure, but it may be a great technique in a rural area uh, where you don't have enough room to widen the road on both sides for to handle some uh, sightline challenges. But in the uphill direction, it, it could be very valuable to widen the shoulder on one side of your road to create that separate shoulder space. Um, again, continuing on with the dooring, other options here are the idea of widening the bike lane. You can per create a buffer. Uh, so that the cyclist feels more comfortable shying away from the doors and riding closer to, to the, move, the adjacent lane of traffic or to actually install a wider parking lane. 
Another very common type of crash is failure to yield, and it, that can be failure to yield by the motorist at a, an intersection or a bicyclist. These are very commonly, uh, very common crashes at uncontrolled intersections or always stop controlled intersections. Um, they a little less common at signal control intersections, uh, but at always stop control intersections, a common behavior you'll see uh, is that bicyclists will slow down as they approach the intersection, but they're uh, not likely to, to stop and dismount uh, if they don't see approaching cars. Um, so the, this, leads, this can lead to conflicts if people are not paying attention or if a motorist doesn't see the cyclist and the, and the cyclist believes they do and pull out and this can lead to a crash. So a very effective strategy in handling this is to install uh, mini circles as you can see here in this photograph. Um, they reduce angle crashes. Um, they don't reduce stop sign running, but they certainly can reduce the impacts of a crash if, in the event people ignore the traffic control device. Uh, they're typically 12 to 16 feet in diameter uh, in an urban area. They can be made to any dimension. Uh, the city of Seattle is actually a great place to look for resources on that. Um, they're very helpful at locations that are uncontrolled, where there's no stop control or yield control, as they deflect approaching motorists and bicyclists, slowing them down. Um, and they're definitely preferable to uh, always stops in situations where you're trying to promote a lot of bicycling on, on local streets. An example of that is a bike boulevard. Um, increasingly, bike boulevards or neighborhood greenways are being used as a design strategy uh, to create an alternative to parallel streets, which may be very high traffic arterials or high speed arterials. Um, and a key element of the bike boulevard is the, is the fact that it's promoting a slower speed operating environment for motorists, that the speeds are closer to those of bicyclists, uh, 12 to 20 miles an hour, um, and that they also try to reduce the amount that bicyclists are required to stop at stop signs so that they have as an option riding along the bike boulevard is as time efficient as riding on the parallel arterial, but it's obviously more comfortable being on the local vo lower volume street. Um, so again, this is an example of putting those pieces together to get a, get that facility. Uh, another common crash can be you know series of crashes that can come up are at intersections and they don't uh, they may have bike lanes they may not have bike lanes but but one common one is the, is the right hook uh, where a bicyclist is riding straight across the intersection and a motorist um, doesn't merge in with them or they race ahead of the bicyclist to try to cut them off and turn right before they do because they're, they're misjudging the approach speed of the bicyclist. This is frequently called a right hook crash. Some countermeasures to the right hook. Uh, probably number one would be adding a right turn lane, uh, creating a separate space where that motorist merges in advance of the intersection across the bicyclist. Um, I think a key aspect of this is adding that notification that the motorist is to yield the bicycles before they enter that lane and that that merge area needs to be of limited duration to minimize the bicyclist's exposure. Um, if you start to have very long merging areas, you really decrease the comfort of the bicycle lane degrading its use. Another treatment that's uh, increasingly being deployed now that um, the Federal Highways approve the use of green in bicycle lanes is actually using the green to highlight that merge area, the conflict area. Um, you can see here in this photograph that it actually it's very strong visually, um, and green's been very effective at raising awareness uh, by motorists to be looking out for bicyclists in these locations. Um, you're allowed to have different patterns. If you're within the bike lane, as you can see behind the gentleman waiting there, um, within the solid lines, uh, the paint would be painted solid green, and within the dashed marking areas, the paint would match the dashed striping. Another potential countermeasure is, uh, as Pete showed the graphic earlier, of that left hook crash type, um, and even this right, the right hook, is just highlighting that conflict zone within the intersection. Um, there's two strategies that you can employ to help manage this. One is just dashing the bike lane through the intersection. 
Uh, and the second is actually to add color in with that bike lane dashing, as you can see here in that photograph. Again, the purpose of this is to add some conspicuity to that conflict point. Um, an additional measure that's kind of new to our toolbox is the use of a bicycle box. Um, a bicycle box can create a space where the bicyclist waits in front of stop traffic at a, at a red light. It makes them more visible, and then when the, when the light turns green, it kind of builds in a head start for them um, to start their movement across the intersection in advance of the motorist, reducing right hook and, in some cases, left hook crashes. Last, you know, it's important to not forget about um, a couple other measures. Uh, Thirty percent, fifty percent of uh, all fatalities happen at night. Uh, you know, a caveat is alcohol is, is a frequent contributor to those fatal crashes, um, but there's also a high percentage of injuries that, that happen at night. Now, photograph you can see here uh, is an example of some of the challenges you have in low light conditions. Um, you may not see drainage grates. There could be deficiencies in the road. Um, if a bicyclist is operating on a sidewalk, there could be cracks or trees intruding into it. All of those could lead to fall-type crashes, which then, if the person's in the street, then they can be hit by a car that, that comes behind them. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, two, the simplest solution is on bicycle lighting, adding the lights to the bicycle. Makes them more visible to approaching motorists, but also allows the bicyclist to see some of these roadway deficiencies. So if you have a lot of nighttime crashes in your community, the key to that is really emphasizing your educational programs. Uh, but also I'd be considering uh, looking at your crash analysis. If you have a location where there's a lot of nighttime crashes and you have opportunities to improve street lighting, that can be a very effective strategy to improve safety. Rumble strips are another aspect of on-road accommodation. Uh, rumble strips have a very strong safety uh, impact for run-off-the-road crashes for motor vehicles, uh, but they can have a very debilitating impact on bicyclist safety if they're not installed properly. So the AASHTO guide has some pretty good recommendations for the installation of rumble strips, and we'd encourage you to take a look at the AASHTO guide. Uh, we'd also encourage you to look at uh, there's a lot of different designs of rumble strips out there, but uh, utilizing a design that is the narrowest and the shallowest for the rumble strip is key to maximize that, that operating space for bicyclists. Uh, there's a number of um, designs out there that come from uh, the initial designs of rumble strips from 15 or 20 years ago that um, more recent research has shown are and maybe a little too aggressive that to achieve the goal of improving safety for motorists without degrading the safety of cyclists. Bridges, viaducts, and tunnels, those are other important areas where um, you generally get one shot to, to build it right, uh, and then you're going to be living with that for the next 50 to 100 years. Um, and it, it's very hard to anticipate land use changes 50 years from now. Um, and so generally, the AASHTO Bike Guide recommends that all of these bridges, viaducts, and tunnels should provide bike accommodation uh, so that you don't end up with situations like you can see on this bridge over a stream where um, the urbanizing area came out beyond this, this location and then this bridge became a pinch point uh, where there's been a number of cyclist uh, crashes due to the fact that the shoulder disappeared and they had to be operating in a lane uh, that was narrow with high speed and high volume traffic. So good design practices on long bridges uh, to provide shared use paths so that you know we're also accommodating pedestrians. Um, ideally they'd be on both sides of the of the roadway. The photo on the left is the Cooper River Bridge in Charleston. It's a very um, famous bridge now, very popular tourist attraction even. Um, and then the other is Interstate 90 Bridge, actually, in Seattle, um, where it's probably one of the longer shared use paths along an interstate bridge in the, in the country. A signal timing, the Ashto Bike Guide, uh, signal timing can have a big impact on safety at intersections. Um, and the key thing is that the Ashto Bike Guide updated in 2012 spoke to two separate conditions. One is starting at is arriving at a, a traffic light on red. 
so that you'd be starting up on the onset of green. And that's called the condition where there's a standing bicycle minimum green. So how much time does it take from the moment that light turns green for a bicyclist to recognize, you know, get on their pedals or clip into their pedals, accelerate and clear an intersection. Uh, so there's some new updated formulas for that. Uh, the next consideration is rolling bicycle minimum green. This is particularly important at intersections that have actuation uh, where we're doing green time extension. So you, the Astro Guide provides pretty good guidance on what a, the assumption should be for the approach speed of the bicyclist so that you can figure out how much ex extension time you should provide uh, and minimum green for that condition. Uh, one thing we want to point out is that you know the acceleration deceleration rates are generally conservative, but you may want to look at your local community. If you have a lot of cr crashes happening uh, with younger children, you may need slower acceleration or deceleration rates uh, at particular locations. Generally, what we find in crashes is that eight children aged 10 to 19 are overrepresented in trap type crashes, and a trap type crash obviously is where uh, a person enters the intersection on green, but they don't have enough time to clear it uh, before the change of the light. They can get hit uh, by that cross traffic. So in conclusion, um, from our discussion today, I want to emphasize that connected networks are increasingly being shown to have a, a direct effect on improving safety of bicyclists. Uh, so having a, a bicycle plan, implementing that plan, and having a fine-grained connected bicycle network can, can lead to safety improvements. Um, increasingly, the public relates the concept of comfort with safety. If they don't feel comfortable on a roadway, they're not going to feel safe. Uh, and generally, if they're feeling uncomfortable on a roadway, that's an indication that there's unsafe conditions on that roadway for them to operate. Um, so there's a relationship there. We don't have it totally scientifically figured out. The We can't quantify that relationship, but it certainly exists. Uh, and it's very powerful in the public's mind. So it's something to be aware of, thinking about. Uh, so again, as Pete had mentioned, you know, the higher volume, higher speed the street is, uh, the more likely and important it would be to provide a separated bicycle facility. Um, obviously, land use terrain, traffic character, they have a strong influence on a facility's use and, the, and its safety uh, in that environment. Uh, education enforcement strategies we haven't talked about. Um, that's not the purpose of this webinar, uh, but they are equally important strategies in, in your approaches to improving bicyclist safety. And lastly, just kind of that takeaway, as Pete mentioned earlier, there's a strong need in our industry uh, to do a better job of counting bicyclists in the communities doing before and after studies as we make these improvements so that we can actually develop some strong crash modification factors so that we can make more informed decisions in the future uh, of improving our roadway system to function safely for bicyclists and other users. Uh, we, this is the conclusion of our second webinar for on-road bike facilities. The next webinar, as Pete mentioned, October 30th. Uh, in two weeks, we're going to discuss the influence of off-road facilities and how to develop and their relationship to improving bicycle safety, safety in a network. So with that, we'll let James lead us through uh, some questions and answers. All right. Thanks, uh, Bill and Peter. And, um, I believe uh, Dan had to leave early, uh, so Dan is no longer on the call. I'm uh, sorry if you had questions for him. You can email him directly your questions at daniel.goodman at dot.gov. Um, but we do have time for Q&A now. If you have not done so already, please enter your question in the question box, and uh, we will try to get to your question. So the first question for today is, pulling up, sorry. How do you get bike-specific data from hospitals? Will they give you numbers of patients admitted for bike accidents? And what other data will they offer uh, given privacy notices? Well, I can start with that one. And, and Bill, you might want to add on to it. Uh, obviously, uh, every hospital is going to have 
you know, different protocols for releasing of data. And typically the data you will receive will not have names on it, so it protects people's privacy. Um, I found the best way to do it is to find champions at the hospital who are involved in safety research and involved in, you know, and really want to do things in the community. So um, I found as simple as, as doing a little research and finding out uh, the names of people at a particular hospital, some of the, the doctors who are, are involved in research, who have published, who have you know, been at seminars and things, and getting to know them personally, uh, they, know, they know the hospital and the system. And quite often, if you can do some research, uh, if you can tie it to a paper, uh, that kind of a thing, uh, you find them more than willing. So it takes a little bit of work. I think it's about relationships and about working pe with people who uh, are at the hospital. Pete covered it perfectly. <laughs> All right. Great. Uh, thank you very much. The next question. Is there information about the advantage or disadvantage of roundabouts for pedestrians and bicyclists in intersection crash crashes and ease of navigation? Well, what we've seen um, in some of the roundabout research is that they definitely are decreasing crashes for for all users. Um, Pete could speak to some specifics of mini circles in Seattle, the history there from the last 30 years. But um, what we're increasingly learning from our friends in Europe and then even here in the United States is that there's a big difference between a single lane roundabout and a multi lane roundabout. Um, and that multi lane roundabouts uh, can present some challenges for pedestrians and for bicyclist safety. Um, and so the general preference is, if we're going to be implementing those, is to stick with one-lane roundabouts if feasible. Um, and as we get into multi-lane roundabouts, it creates a situation where you're going to want to design in a separate bike facility around the perimeter of the roundabout, uh, which could be a protected bike lane or a shared-use path. Um, and you may even need to install, in some cases, some activated warning device, uh, such as a rapid flashing beacon, at some of the pedestrian crossings if it's a very, very high volume uh, type of roundabout. And there's been some research recently, I believe, on that issue of adding a rapid flashing beacon at roundabout exits. So maybe I can't put it close at hand, but I think it's being done out of um, Austin or University of Texas. All yeah, right. I think you, Thank you. you covered it. Um, are there any studies that show a correlation between bike improvements and reduction of vehicle trips generated on state highway systems from local development or from increased travel induced by infrastructure improvements? Well, then. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's an, it's an interesting one. I mean, uh, the question is kind of oriented the state highway, but I'd say it's really a land use question. Um, so I'll give you an example. I live here in Washington, D.C., and we had the statistics, or that you saw a couple, couple graphics earlier from Washington, D.C. As we built out our network from 2000 to 2000, well, to, till today, but the, the graphic stopped at 2010, um, you could see that as we built up the network, we were increasing um, the percentages of those bicyclists commuting to work so that there was a facility where they felt comfortable. Uh, but secondarily to that is the land use has been changing too in D.C. It's getting a significantly more dense. Um, we've added 100,000 new residents to, to the District of Columbia in the last 10 years. And the automotive trips have not increased at all. Um, so there's, there's a very vast increase has been shifted to walking, to biking, using transit, um, and the fact that given that land use, that people are living and working within the same area. Um, so I, I, we've seen evidence of that in some other cities as well. Um, so I think it's kind of that puzzle of the, the combination of land use, getting the land use right is really important. Yeah, I would just totally agree with what you said, Bill. And uh, you know, I, I don't think it's always possible to draw a one-to-one -one correlation between more bike use and then 
the number of cars on a given route, whether it be a state route or other route. Uh, but we're, what we are seeing in a lot of communities, again, is, is the population, the number of households going up, and then bicycling, uh, number of bicycles going up, pedestrians, transit, and then the total number of vehicle trips and the vehicle miles driven, either plateauing or in some cases even going down while that other is going on. So that, that's what we observe, uh, drawing the cause and effect relationships. I think that's also an area where we probably could do some more research. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. On one-way vehicular streets, should two-way bicycle lanes be combined on one side of the street or on both sides of the, of the vehicular traffic? When, when I get a question like that, I always have to, there's, there's one answer you always give, and it's going to be, it depends. <laughs> uh, you, re, you really need to know a lot more information in terms of turning movements, driveways, destinations, width, space, volume, speed. Um, but it's hard to, hard to speak to that. Um, I think the most common one you see is going to be a one-lane counter flow uh, bike lane. I mean, traditionally, that was what people would do. And then, and then you would have you know, another lane with the flow of motor vehicle traffic or shared lane marking, uh, like what was shown in the picture uh, Bill showed, uh, that one picture of the counter flow lane. But um, you know, with protected bike lane cycle tracks, you're also starting to see some of the other situation. So what's exactly the best situation is really going to be uh, very location dependent, I think. I can follow up with another example. Um, when we designed a cycle track on 15th Street in DC, it was a one-way street where we there was a strong desire for a counterflow bike accommodation. So initially, it was a designed as a contraflow bike protected bike lane, and then in the for the southbound, and the street was one way northbound. Uh, and the northbound street had a shared lane going northbound with, with shared lane markings in it. Uh, but once that protected bike lane went in contra flow southbound, the public started riding in it in two directions because they preferred the separation. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had to go back in after um, and retrofit that to make it a two way protected bike lane. Um, to deal with the public demand for it, uh, and it's turned out to be a very successful project. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Next question, are you aware of any sources for designing the terminus of a bicycle lane uh, due to change in roadway cross-section uh, not supporting striped bike lanes? The Astro Guide would be a good resource to look at termination of bike lane or transitions to, to shared lanes. Um, there's some guidance in there that recommends that transition from a bike lane, tapering it out and dashing it uh, to the transition point where it becomes a shared lane situation where you'd want to add a shared lane marking and, and a bikes may use full lane sign or possibly a share the road sign. I would just add to that, I think the, the biggest concern that usually happens is you end up directing people on the wrong side of the road. And it gets back, for example, to the, the bridge example uh, that Bill showed is if you only have a facility on one side of a bridge and on both sides of the bridge, say you have a bike lane, um, that's where you, you can end up directing people to the wrong place. So it's, it's that bigger picture network kind of thinking and how those transitions occur that, that really have to be thought out ahead of time. All right, thank you. Great. Uh, next question. Can you talk a little more about how bike boxes encourage motorists to merge into the bike lane before turning? Uh, it's a separate issue. So the bike box doesn't encourage or discourage it. Um, the key to, if you want to promote that type of behavior of merging into a bike lane before the intersection is to, is to dash the bike lane in advance of the intersection. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, the next question. We hear that the green paint is slick when wet. Is that true? And if so, are there any methods that can be used to increase traction? I would just add that um, without mentioning any specific companies, I think that's a solved problem. Um, some of the earlier green uh, materials 
uh, were slippery, and uh, uh, with you know greater demand now for green bike lanes, you're seeing a lot of new products. Uh, they're lasting longer. Uh, they're keeping their green color longer, and the coefficient of uh, friction is better. And uh, uh, I, that's one of those things you just need to research and talk to some of the communities that are doing a lot of green bike lanes. Um, uh, a number of communities, uh, including uh, my community here in Seattle, I know they, they looked at a number of different products, put them down in some of their, their yards where they have their trucks, and, and tried a lot of different combinations, see how long they lasted. Uh, did they, we get a lot of rain here. Uh, how do they work? So I think there's, there's with a little research, um, that, that's something we could follow up with later. Um, there's, there's good materials out there. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Next question. With regard to bridges, viaducts, and tunnels, would it not be cheaper and easier to train drivers to expect bicyclists in the traffic lane and to not drive faster than they can see ahead, even on highway high-speed streets and highways? Well, well, after the fact that you've built it and that's all you got, then that's your that's a remaining strategy. Um, how effective that is would be another another story. We're not, I think, generally as you observe the operating environment, uh, it can be a challenge to get people to drive slow, and especially in those types of road environments, the road design is sending you all the signals that it's okay to to drive faster typically, um, and so that would be very difficult to get people to operate slower. Uh, so the key is to build it right the first time. Um, and, and get it right. After the fact, it's very difficult to make it a safe environment. All right, thank you. This next question relates to a car-only parkway with a 55 mile per hour speed limit and a parallel cycle track. How would you protect bicyclists from cars, from car traffic accidentally entering the cycle track uh, and running off the road? Would you use a guardrail or barrier or fencing, grading? Um, I would, again, I would look at the Ashto Bike Guide as a good resource for making that decision. It'll, it'll come down to the, the roadway design and how close it is to the roadway uh, and what your options are for that type of situation. You also have to weigh at a higher level what's the likelihood of that type of crash occurring. Um, and so there's going to be a cost-benefit decision on providing guardrail continuously between those two types of facilities. All right, thank you. Um, with this next question, do I need to revise signal timing for bicycles if the bicycles operate using shared lanes with vehicles at the intersection? Absolutely. Um, again, if you've, I see this quite often that you might have a local street that's shared lane crossing a, an arterial that might be, or even a limited access highway that could be six, seven, eight lanes across, um, and that you get situations where bicyclists aren't detected uh, to be able to actuate a signal. Um, and then where they are detected, they're not given enough time because we're giving a minimum green time, uh, assuming that the, it, they're a motorist um, and that they can accelerate as fast as a motorist. And so I, I see and observe, and I've, I've certainly reviewed a number of crash reports where bicyclists were not provided that time. Uh, they are a legal road user, so they need to be provided that time, but they weren't provided that time and were struck by vehicles as a consequence. I would just very quickly add to that. Um, where I've seen that kind of situation occur frequently is where you have uh, sort of odd intersections, ones that are offset or maybe have you know a five-way or even a six-way intersection, quite often usually five-way, where the, the travel time sort of the, to get through the intersection is increased because of that. And in particular, those areas, you end up uh, as a bicyclist in the intersection without being able to clear it. OK. Thank you very much. Which have you found more effective, pavement markings or signage? Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll start, and Bill, I'm, you, you chime in. Uh, part of it depends. Um, you know, you can be in a very urban situation where uh, you have really short block faces, and in signage, you're just you're just not going to compete very well because there's so much competition for that visual, and the distances are so short. Um, 
uh, you're, you're probably going to end up with more pavement markings. Uh, I think there's other situations, rural situations, where especially if you're going faster, um, sometimes you really want to go to a sign. Uh, something on the pavement just isn't going to last very long and you may just not see it because you're going faster. So uh, it, it really is context uh, specific. And Bill, do you want to add anything? Sure, I can add in. Um, I find that pavement markings are, are very important. Uh, it's, there's a strong demand. That's why there's such a strong demand for bike lanes and creating that delineated separate space, you know, having shoulders in rural areas. Um, when it comes to the place where I find signs to be most effective is, uh, or, or can be, and can be more effective, is those uh, reminder signs of the law. The bikes may use full lane sign can be very helpful. Um, it's regulatory. It helps people understand that it's okay and it's actually allowed for bicyclists to be out in the lane. Uh, that can be more effective than a share the road sign. Um, Another area that signs tend to be a little bit more effective is uh, crossings, uh, making sure people understand that they may not be aware. So if you're going to install a bike boulevard, you know, it's a local street, kind of a quiet looking street, uh, but it's crossing a major road, you know, there could be benefit to, to adding a sign um, that has the bicycle and pedestrian symbol on it. Uh, but but helping people understand to expect bicyclists crossing there. So sort of those unexpected crossings can be useful uh, to have signs in those situations. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is, how can ra riding on a raised, separated bike lane be any safer than riding on a sidewalk? Um, the key there, there's, there's some recent research that's showing that um, the safety of sidewalks historically has been shown. Past research studies have really emphasized riding on sidewalks to be dangerous. Uh, but I think the more that we've started to look at it, and I think the challenge is those past studies didn't differentiate wrong way riding from riding with traffic. Um, and that the more that people are re-looking at old studies and then looking at new data, uh, such as what we were looking at in Denver, we're finding that really the major cause of, of sidewalk crashes is the wrong way riding. Um, so from that standpoint, whether it's safer or if there's any difference of riding on a cycle track to a sidewalk, uh, I think a lot has to do with it with that direction of travel in the wrong way or right way uh, as, re as it relates to the direction of the adjacent motor vehicle travel. Um, but there's another key distinction in a cycle track or a separated bike lane that um, Generally, those are more deliberate design than a sidewalk. So there's a lot more thought that's been put into the intersection design, the geometry of it, um, that I think differentiates it from just a standard sidewalk treatment, uh, which will lead it to being a safer facility. Yeah, I would just add to that. I think it's about uh, creating uh, expectations with motorists and pedestrians, uh, be because as Bill you said, there's a lot more thought put into it. They're usually very obvious as being bike facilities uh, with a lot of different paint and signs and markings and signals. And so uh, you really create that expectation, expect to see bicyclists here. And, uh, and plus they get used so, so, so much. Uh, there's always bicyclists there. So you, you really built it into something that motorists are going to look out for. On sidewalks, quite often they're more occasional. And also you're not expecting bicyclists at a little higher rate of speed, you're expecting pedestrians. So you're, you're part of it's managing that expectation. Uh, the, the other thing that's nice about uh, protected bike lanes, cycle tracks, of course, is that they're exclusive to bikes. Uh, you're not mixing it up with the, with the pedestrians. So that, that confusion is not there. And, and obviously, there's, there's safety issues for pedestrians as well. OK, thank you. Are there any jurisdictional liabilities for posting shared-use bike applications, such as share roads or share the road signs, on roadways that do not have bicycle facility classifications, like Class Three roads? I don't know, <laughs> Bill. If I quite understand that question, um, you know, the 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 old classification system is is used in a few states yet. Um, class one, class two, class three. Uh, it's not used everywhere. Um, 
I think in general with the new ASHTO guide, um, you know, if you want to assign a route or if you want to put shared lane markings on it, I don't think it has to have a designated classification, but may, maybe you want to add to that. No, they don't. I mean, there's no um, association of liability to that. The liability comes into the due care of the quality of the design. So if you you would be liable or could be liable if you put in a share and you're not following the recommended marking practices of its placement. Um, there'd be liability incurred if you installed a bike lane and you decided to make it narrower than the guidance suggests. Um, those are what get you in trouble. It's not putting the facility on any type of street. Um, it's following through and, and documenting your design, following through, following good design practice, number one, and then documenting places where you deviate and having a, a good explanation uh, for why that, that was a safe engineering decision is, is what's important when it comes to liability. Okay. How do you feel about a shared use path crossing an interstate off-ramp? Well, you know, usually when, when you look at a crossing, there's three variables you look at. Um, you know, you look at, at speed, you look at number of lanes width, and you look at ADT, the traffic. And um, so part of the answer is it depends. Uh, some, some can work quite well, and some can be a challenge. But I think quite often uh, ramps um, can, you know, with careful design, uh, a crossing can work. Uh, because usually it's typically it's just one lane, and if you're getting good gaps and you have good sight distance, uh, and you you do it in a way that that it forces the cyclist to you know approach at 90 degrees, uh, look both ways. Um, there's situations where it can work, but not every situation. And I would add in, you know, it, it's the key thing is good sight lines from the motorist standpoint and the bicyclist standpoint. The second thing is, are there gaps in traffic that they can actually cross that, that street? Yep. Uh, we've certainly seen uh, some ramp situations where the path comes up that had to be signal controlled um, because the volumes were just too high or the sight lines were not safe to allow a safe crossing. All right, thank you. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, so the next question is, Assuming a shoulder meets bike lane width requirements, is it generally preferable to mark it with bike symbols and arrows to make it a formal bike lane, or should you just leave it unmarked? I'll start, and then, you know, again, I think the answer is it depends. So, for example, if, if you have a roadway with shoulders, and it's a roadway that connects, say, two trails, so you're getting a lot of people on it. You're getting a lot of more inexperienced cyclists uh, to formalize that and make it a bike lane and add the symbols. Probably is a good idea. Um, um, and the, and uh, also, if uh, sort of on the other hand, uh, some places you have have shoulders that are, are used. You know, uh, I've seen uh, mountain situations where you know it tells you to use the shoulder and pull over if if you're a slow vehicle or something like that. So you wouldn't want to make that sort of extreme, but you wouldn't want to make it a bike lane. So, uh, but, but certainly I think it's context sensitive, and it really gets back to connectivity, the system, the user, all those kinds of things in terms of, of how you want to market. Yeah, there's a lot of value in adding the bike lane symbols just from the standpoint of having a, visually connection, a visual connection for the bicyclist to know they're confirmed, they're on the right route. It's connecting between other points. So if they've been on a system of bike lanes or trails and they've got that feedback uh, and suddenly they're on a shoulder and there's no signs or no markings, it could cause them some concern that they're not on the right route. Um, I think another aspect of that, too, is if you're trying to emphasize uh, bicyclists to operate in the same direction as traffic uh, and you want to discourage two-way riding in a shoulder, then that addition of the symbols and the desired direction can further emphasize that and help manage that expectation. All right, thank you. I, I think this will be our last question for today. In your experience, is using delineators in a buffer space between the motorist lane and bike lane an effective and worthwhile option? 
And do they make removable delineators to account for snow plowing in colder climates? Uh, the answer to both of those questions is yes. Um, increasingly seeing more flexible delineators put in to create a separation. Um, also seeing instances where um, agencies in snow climates uh, are installing a bolt-down version that they can just come in and remove. Um, some examples, actually, one in D.C., high profiles, uh, the Pennsylvania Avenue uh, center of the road cycle track has removable posts so that when the presidential inauguration comes through, uh, they're easy to take out for, for parades. In fact, some of them uh, are more like a, you know, they're where the bolts are, it's just below the surface, and they're almost like a, a twist and snap kind of uh, operation. And so a variation on that is you'll see those where you have the school crossing guards and you're putting in putting in a, a delineator with a sign on it for you know temporary for a short period of time, and then and then it can come out again. So uh, I think the technology has moved a lot in the last few years. Uh, they're also a lot more durable than they were a few years ago. So um, totally agree. Uh, it's yes and yes. All right. Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have for discussion today. I'm sorry if we did not get to your questions. We hope you will join us October 30th for part three of this series where we will be discussing off-road facilities. A PDF copy of today's presentation is available online at headbikeinfo.org slash webinars under the BSAP webinars link. Uh, and a recording of today's program will be posted to that site as well as to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash headbikeinfo within a couple of weeks. Be sure to follow us on Facebook. Again, that's facebook.com slash pedbike for updates. And I want to remind you that a brief survey will appear once the webinar is ended. We very much appreciate you taking a moment to complete it. Thank you again to our speakers, Dan Goodman, Phil Schultheis, and Peter Lagerway. And thank you to all of you for attending, today, for attending today's PBIC Livable Communities webinar.